<laughs> Let's talk about this a little bit. What's the limit? <laughs> Ideas. <laughs> Okay, a boundary. I like that. Boundary. All four of us. Okay. All four That's just me. That's just me. All four of us. Any other ideas? Yes. Restriction. Restriction. Okay. Good. Restriction. Good. These are all, and these would apply just, you know, if we were just talking about a limit in conversational stuff or in math. I mean, it all applies. Let me get just a little more specific here. Let's talk about maybe a limit, and let's look at something like this. What if I said? Okay, so what if I said this? What if I said I want to take, find the limit of all Well, let's let's talk about some of this stuff. Let's. It's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah. Let's pick this apart a little bit. What's that? That's a function, isn't it? How do you know what tells you? That's an important word. Good. That's a loaded math word, isn't it? That is a function. What? Why? Why are you calling that a function? You're exactly right. Say it again. F of x. Okay, that is the specific notation that we use when we're talking about a function, isn't it? Right? And remember, you might have talked about in the past f of x being really just kind of a fancy way of saying what? Why? Why? Sure. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is like saying I'm going to plug in values of x, the dependent or independent variable. So if I write, if I say something like this, if I say y equals f of x, and I'm going to graph this, I'm going to say I'm just going to graph something here, and we actually will look at a graph of this. Let's arbitrarily just say that, that the graph looks like, you know, I just say it looks like that. Who knows? Okay. So I am plugging in values of what to find values of what? Fill in the blanks. I'm plugging in values of x. X to find values of y. y. Okay. So then which one? Now think about that statement. Let me say that again. Here's what you told me. I'm plugging in values of x to find values of y. Which one is depending on which there? The y is y. The y. You can tell by the way we say that, that the y is depending on the x, isn't it? I'm, I'm plugging in the, the, the value we calculate for y is dependent on the value that we're sticking into the function for x, right? Okay, so we're going to make a couple associations here. And you've done this in the past, but let's take a second and review this. So then we would say that the x is the independent variable, and the y is the dependent variable. Uh, and which one goes on which axis, obviously? Which, what axis is this? X. X. Y. 
and why. Okay, and, and we can we can form a couple associations here. Then I mean, it's, you guys are you're not going to need this, but we know in alphabetical order X, Y, D before I, dependent, independent, right? Uh, so X is the independent variable that we're feeding our function, right? And we're plugging it into this formula, right? That's the recipe that this function is using to calculate values of y or f of x as we plug in values of x, right? So for example, and, and you remember t-tables from way back in the day? We could, we could make a t-table here and let me just do this. I, I recommend these things. Yeah, get one of these in your room at home. These are kind of <laughs> I'm going to do stuff like that a lot, too. It's probably really entertaining to watch me like that. Okay, so if I were to just pick x equals 0, what's the value of, of the function at, at 0? 1. 1, sure. I'm going to get 0 minus 1 over 0 minus 1, negative 1 over negative 1, 1, right? And we could keep going with that. We could, you know, we could make as many of those as we want to. And way back in, in middle school, you probably did some things like made a whole bunch of these ordered pairs. And let's let's, uh, let's do one other thing here. Let me go ahead and draw something out here. Like that. And, oh, didn't want to do that either, but oh well. What if I make another ordered pair at, say, x equals 2? What's that going to do? Seven. 7, isn't it? Good. I'm going to get 8 minus 1 over 2 minus 1. And this is kind of handy. I can think of those. Those are ordered pairs. So in terms of a graph, what do I do with those? Yeah, that's the point zero one and the point two seven, right? So I could go over zero and up one, over two and up. So I get something like that, right? And I could make a whole bunch of those things and create kind of a smooth curve, right? Okay. Now my question I was asking you, you. We've got this function here, and we want to find the limit of this function as x approaches 1. Now, that's calculus language right there. Uh, what is that saying, do you suppose? Find where it stops. Find where it stops when x is 1, maybe, right? Good idea. How, what's the strategy? Plug in 1. Sure, why not? OK, well, let's plug in 1. What happens if I, on my t-table here, that's no big deal, right? I'll just plug in plug in 1. If I plug in 1, what do I get? 0. 0 over 0. What's that? That's what is it last year? Ah, it's undefined. Yeah, we can't do that. We can divide. We can do lots of stuff in division. I can divide 0 by a number. What's that equal to? Zero. I can take any non-zero number divided by any non-zero number, and I just get a fraction, right? I get a rational number. Uh, could I divide a number by zero? No. I can't divide a number by zero. In fact, we're going to talk about that. In calculus, uh, a lot of we like to explore kind of the oddities and the like, and that's one of the things we're going to explore. Is what, have, what does that mean to divide something by zero? Well, we can. In about a month, you guys will be experts at that. Uh, there are two basic rules, and I'll just, you can tell me what these are. Think about these for a second. In fact, take, you know, 20 seconds at your table. For real numbers, there are two fundamental no-nos. There are two things we can't do. And you've probably said these things a thousand times, or they've been said to you a thousand times. You can't do this, and you can't do this with real numbers. It's forbidden. See if you can come up with what those are. There's two. Yeah. Okay, there's, and now I'll get it started. There's one. Good. One of them is you can't take an even root, square root included, but it couldn't be a fourth root or a sixth root or a hundredth root. You can't take an even root of a negative number for the set of real numbers. Now, we can for some other numbers, but not for real numbers. What are the other numbers called? Imaginary numbers. Good. 
And then now, now we say it out loud at your table. What's the other thing that you can't do? You can't take an even root of the negative number and you can't take a second and think about that. I think I probably nobody heard that. What is it? Can't divide by zero. Yeah. Can't divide by zero. That is also something that just doesn't work. And so our strategy, it was a great idea. But when we tried it, we got some answer that was highly unfulfilling. It didn't really help us much. So what do you think? What does this mean then? What's the limit of this function as x approaches 1? What do you think they're getting at mathematically then? The function does not exist. It's undefined at x equals 1 because it gives us a denominator of 0, and that's against the rules. It's kind of, it's a really subtle point. Okay, now it's, 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 now I like that idea. You remember talking about asymptotes last year and the year before? Asymptotes are places that a function approaches but never gets to, kind of. Like, let's draw a picture of one. And, and, and it's the right concept. It's not precisely the right answer, but it's the right concept. And we'll just take that idea and explore it a little further. This is... Like, you've probably seen stuff like this, right? Remember when we, if that's an asymptote and our function maybe does something like, like that kind of a thing, where it approaches, it hugs that vertical line, never actually touches it. Remember that kind of stuff? Same idea, same idea. How about if we just explore this thing? We'll cheat a little bit. We'll lean on some technology. Let's take this function and let's graph it and just see what happens. How about? Let's explore the graph a little bit. So you might want to get out your calculators. Okay, so on our trusty calculators, how about... Okay, so how do I graph this function then? Tell me what are the what are some ways on we gotta review the calculator use a little bit. We're gonna use these things a lot. So how do I put that function in my calculator? Okay, y equals. Let me go ahead and I wanna and on, on y equals I wanna just make sure everything's either got two options. Either I have to unhighlight the equal signs to turn those graphs off, or even better yet, in this case, those are from last year, so I'm just gonna clear them. Okay. What do I do? Put that in there. Parentheses. Okay, good. So I'm going to open a set of parentheses. X cubed. And, and just one little quick thing here. You guys, you're applying this, but I got to hit that left arrow to get out of the exponent. Minus one. Close parentheses. Very good. Divided by. Open parentheses, minus 1. Okay? That makes sense. Any questions on that? Looks good, right? Okay, and let's, I'm just going to go ahead. Now, when I want to graph something, do I just hit graph? I can, but I'm sort of at the mercy of, it's like spinning the wheel. Uh, I don't know what the window is going to be set at. Whatever I last used is what I'm going to get. So where, where's a good starting place generally for graphs? Say it again. 10 by 10. 10 by 10. How do I get that? 
Uh, actually, there's a, there's a shortcut. I, instead of hitting graph when I, when I am trying to graph a function or, or one or more functions, if I want to just get kind of a standard negative 10 to positive 10, negative 10 to positive 10 kind of a thing, I just go zoom 6, zoom standard. Okay? So then instead of graph, just always get in the habit of hitting zoom 6. And that's what I see. Okay, make sense? So that's a pretty normal looking function. How would you describe that? It looks an awful lot like a parabola, doesn't it? It is a parabola. Very soon we'll talk about why that's a parabola. We're not going to maybe get, get there today, but tomorrow, well, next day probably. Um, let's, let's think about this now. I, I want to introduce kind of an exotic species of ant, two-dimensional ant, that lives in this classroom, the calculus ant. The calculus ant is point-like in size, infinitesimally small. They live in this two-dimensional surface, and they, they just they can walk on functions. They, that's kind of where they live. So as these calculus ants stroll along this function, they, they have the built-in sensors that, that, that are able to sense their uh, position on the coordinate plane. They always know their x and y coordinates. As this calculus ant is walking along this function, well, the calculator tells us what his sensor is, is, is seeing. If I do something like, what if I want to know the coordinates of this function at, let me make this a little bigger. Ah, not that good. What if I want to know the coordinates at x equals negative 2? How do I do that on the, on the calculator? Table. Say it again. I, okay, I could do tables. Yeah, that's one way to do it, sure. I could go table, so second table, and x is currently at 6,000. That's pretty big. <laughs> can, I, can I just type in a number directly on the table? Let's try it. What if I type in 0? Uh, it doesn't know what to do, does it? No. Okay, so I might have to reset the table. Then we know how to do that? Because I'm way up there. I don't want to manually... Keep you know, scroll up that column. We'll be here all period. On your, you probably can't see it up here so well, but if you look at your calculator, do you see a place maybe to reset that table? Uh, where are you seeing that table plus? <laughs> table set. How about that? Table set is up here. It, it's it's going to be the second, because it's blue in my case, right? It's going to be the second F2 button. So if I hit second F2, I get table set. And right now it's starting at 6,000. Is that a good idea? Well, maybe not. How about if we just start at zero? And then I'll just go second table. And now we're at zero. And now I can go either way. If I want to go up a little bit, I just do that. So at negative 2, when x is negative 2, oh. y is 3, right? Mm -hmm. No big deal. When x is negative 1, y is 1, right? These are telling me the, the positions, the x and y coordinates of that ant as he's walking along the function. What's another way of doing that on the graph? And we're just, you know, just going to kind of we'll take this as an opportunity to sort of catch up to speed on lots of things, calculator included. So we can use the table. How else can we find the, the x and y coordinates of the, of the ant, the calculus ant, as he walks along this function? Second calc. Second calc. Ah, good. OK, we can do second calc. And that gives, that's a really important screen. This is a biggie. Second calc takes us to the calculate screen, and it gives us a whole range of options of different tricks that we can do for, it, for a graph. Right? We can calculate all of these things for a graph now. Which one do we want? One, value, yeah. We want the value because value in math simply means number. When And, and I'm going to take this opportunity real quick to remind you of something else. If you ever see the words I'm real particular about vocabulary. It's vocabulary is often ill-defined in math. People just throw words at you and don't often define them. When you're asked to evaluate a function, say, uh, 
f of x at x equals 3, what are you doing? What does it mean when, when you, in math terms, when we say evaluate something? Good. You want to find the value, the number of the function, when the independent variable is that number, right? Value means number. We're going to plug in a value of x and find the numerical value of the function, right? Find the value of y, essentially. Make sense? So just remember, and that's easy to remember if you just remember that value means number. Okay? Oh, oh tricky, huh? How about that? <laughs> Yeah, we have all kinds of bonus things. So value, that's a really, that's a really handy, uh, it's a pretty simple one, but a really handy uh, ability with, with these graphs. If I, if I go ahead and choose one, then it's going to prompt me for an x value. So if, once again, if I want to find the value at x equals negative 2, I just type in x equals negative 2, hit enter, and look what it does. It puts the cursor right on that point, and it gives me the ordered pair. X is negative 2, Y is 3. How about that? Yeah. Good stuff. What's another way? There's just a plethora of options here. Embarrassment of riches. What else can we do to find the X and Y coordinates of the calculus ant as he walks along this function? Trace. We could trace. Okay, trace is another option. Trace is my least favorite of all the options, though. How come, you suppose? Oh, okay, good. It's not accurate in what way? Okay, yeah, because the, the, when, when I trace, I'm taking, the, the ant is taking steps of fixed size, and he's only giving you the coordinates when he steps down, essentially, right? I'm moving in discrete, uh, the discrete changes in my x. So watch, if I hit the right button, look, it's going to, the x changes by a certain amount. If I hit it again, it's going to change by that same amount. What is that amount? It's arbitrary. How do you control it? I don't know. There's probably a way to do it, but I don't know. It's not worth messing with. Trace is, it, it, it's not a bad, maybe in rare cases, it gives you an idea of sort of what the function is doing, but it's not very precise. Okay, we, that's, that's my least favorite of the options. I think we about, you know, took care of a business here, and I think we pretty much exhausted the, the, at least the really useful ones. I'll give you a shortcut for one of those, though. This is kind of handy. Instead of having to go second cal, because we're, you know, of course we're lazy, we want to do, push all those buttons, you can just do this. Trace is useful in this way. If I hit the trace button, which pulls up the x and y coordinates, if I just hit trace and then type in the x value, like 2, for example, look what it does. It puts x equals 2, and if I hit enter, that's good, right? Okay. So you can just hit trace and then a number, and it'll put the x on that number. It's just a little bit quicker. Okay? Okay, but now, okay, so we got kind of the, we're getting... We're shaking off the rust here a little bit. We're, we got this calculus ant walking along this function. What happens when he gets to one? If he gets to, if he gets to like, uh, let's see, if he goes to zero, okay, we're at y equals one. If he goes to 0.5, we're right there. If he goes to 0.9, we're right there. His value is about. What is that? It's a negative nine. Negative nine. You oh, there's. Well, I put negative nine. I'm one. There we go. Okay, that's a little off. Okay, point nine. He's at two point seven one. If I go point nine nine, he's at. It looks like two point nine seven zero oh one. If I go point nine 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 nine. He's at 2.9997. So as this calculus, calculus ant takes itsy bitsy steps from the left, right, as he's walking from negative numbers towards positive numbers, as he approaches that value of x equals 1, we're kind of tracking his y values. What's it look like he's trying to get to? Three. Three. It just looks like that, doesn't it? What's a way we could maybe check that? I could keep going with this. I could pick 0.9999999. What's another way? Any other ideas? It sure looks like he's trying to approach 3, doesn't it? Could I check maybe something similar but just slightly different to... Ah, okay, now good. 
Think about this in terms of the picture we drew in our minds of this. The ant was walking from left to right towards that mystery spot at x equals 1. What if we walk from right to left towards the same spot? Right? We could start at, say, 2. We could work our way backwards. Uh, 1.5, and I'll cut this short. 1.5 gets us to 4.75. What if we do like 1.99? Oops, 0.9. No, 0.1, sorry. 1.01. 3.0, we get the idea, right? If I did something like 1.000001, 1, there we go. I get 3 point, a whole bunch of zeros in a 3, right? So it's, it's clearly approaching 3 from both sides, but what's going to happen if the ant steps on x equals 1? Calculator breaks. It doesn't. There is no y value because the function doesn't exist there, right? It disappears. Okay. So now that's. I mean, that seemed like we did a lot there, but we just did it. We just pointed out a very important, subtle point in math. See if that informs your table's definition of a limit. Then, in terms of a calculus ant, in terms of this little. I don't know what his name is, but in terms of this little calculus ant. What is that limit? What does it mean? Think about that. <laughs> the limit of our function that we've got graphed, right? <laughs> kind of, yeah. We lost it. Okay, let's talk about this. Let's go to this table back here. You guys take the floor. What, what do you think? Any ideas? What is that? Can we invent a way that we could describe what a limit means in terms of our calculus ant? What is the limit of f of x as x approaches 1? Any ideas? Throw it out to everybody. Any any ideas? The point where the function ends. Point where the function ends. Okay, we're getting there. Kind of. Yeah. This is the idea. How about this one? I'm gonna throw something out. How about is it where the is it where the calculus ant actually ends up being when x equals one? No. Say it again. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> is it is it where he actually ends up being? No. No, it's not. How come? You're right. It doesn't, exist. doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. When the calculus ant actually steps on x equals one, he just blinks out of existence because it doesn't that the function doesn't exist. There's no place for him to stand there. Right? So that is not what it is. Now I can't overemphasize the importance of that statement. So everybody tattoo that in your brains. A limit. Okay, I want everybody I need everybody's absolute attention because this is such an important statement. Catch you this in your brains. A limit is not the value of a function for a specified x value. That's not what it is. Because in this case, the function doesn't even exist. But as the ant takes these incrementally smaller steps from the left or the right towards the x value of 1, let's pretend that a dense fog has rolled into flatland up there, and he can't see where he's going at all. But he's walking along this function, and he does have that built-in innate sense to sense of, of position. Right? He knows what his x and y coordinates are. If you were to talk to the ant as he's walking along this function, he doesn't anticipate anything weird. If you said, hey, buddy, where do you, where do you think you're going to be when x equals 1, what's he going to say? 3. Three. Sure. Now, that's the limit. The limit is not where he's going to be. It's where he anticipates he's going to be when he steps on x equals 1. See the difference? 
as he gets infinitesimally close to x equals 1, what's he, where does he think he's going to be? Not where he's going to be, but where does he think he's going to be? That's the, that's the essence of a limit. Okay? Here's another way to think about that. Let's just say that we're going we're gonna to make some, some suppositions here, which probably are not borne out by reality. If, let's just say that, first of all, I'm going to live forever. That's certainly not going to happen. Let's say for every second for the rest of eternity, I'm just going to have my distance to the door. So the first step is a pretty big one, but then they start to get smaller as I go further and further. Let's make another supposition. Let's suppose that we can subdivide space infinitely, which probably, by the way, doesn't work. You get down to about 10 to the minus 46 meters, and that's called the Planck length, and it turns out that in our weird universe, distance doesn't even exist beneath that. But uh, let's just say, mathematically speaking, that we can, we can subdivide space infinitesimally, so we can make things as small as we want to without limit, which mathematically we can't. Uh, Let's also say that I have a really fine-tipped pen. Uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. Am I ever going to get to the door? No. No, I'm not, am I? And that's pretty clear, isn't it? Because if my steps are always, I'm always stepping half the distance to the door, I mean, it's pretty clear I'm never going to get to the door, right? Let me ask you this. Is there, if I have a super fine-tipped, infinitely fine-tipped pen, and I make a dot on the floor, someplace between me and the door, is there any dot that I could ever draw that I wouldn't step on? Ooh, think that one was. Take, take, take a minute. I'll give you a whole 60 seconds at your table to think about that and discuss it. Debate it. Of course, right? 
how many real numbers, obviously an infinite number, how many real numbers are there between two integers on the number line? So which is bigger? Ooh. Okay, we'll get into that later. <laughs> the same size. And there is an answer, by the way, there is an answer. There is an answer. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, so you get the idea that this is that is a limit. That's the concept of a limit. A limit is merely the value that a function is approaching, but not necessarily getting to. Now, in some cases, limits are really easy to find. This one was a little bit tricky, right? Because we tried initially plugging one into the function, and we was we didn't get an answer, right? And so we had to either use a graph, and on the graph we could just extrapolate or interpolate. We could just walk along this graph and say, OK, when x equals 1, that's where we'd be, right there. We'd be at a value of 3 right, on the graph. Or we used a table. We could also go to our table. If I go back to my table here, I'm going to go ahead and put the start value at 1. And I'm going to let the incremental values on the table, instead of going by ones, what if I went by like 0 0.01s? And if I look at my table now, and I'll scoot up a little bit, we can kind of trace the progress here. As the x values approach 1 from the left, we would say, and by left we mean left on an xy plane, from values less than 1, the y values are pretty clearly trying to get to 3, aren't they? As x approaches 1 from the right, from values bigger than 1, where the y values are decreasing towards 3. right? And so we can kind of track the answer either way, graphically or numerically using a table. Now, next time we talk about this, I'm not sure if that'll be tomorrow or maybe the next day. I think we'll kind of feed it, you know, build in a little bit of review in between. Depends on when we get our stuff. We're going to look at a much more maybe fulfilling way of doing this. Can we not have to kind of cheat? Does that seem a little cheesy to make a table or make a graph? Or what if the graph's really hard to make? Right? I mean, we don't, we don't have a calculator to make a table, and that just seems like that's not very precise. We're going to we're going to come up with some ways to do this analytically, where we can say, okay, let's do some math on this and come up with an exact answer, not an approximation based on a table or a graph. And that's sort of the next step, but it doesn't change the meaning of what we just did. We just found the value that the function approaches when x is 1. Now, this would have been much easier, wouldn't it, if we had asked for the value of the limit as x approaches, say, 2. Why is that so much easier? It means the same thing. What's the value that the ant is approaching when x is 2? So imagine the calculus fog rolls in, and we say, hey, buddy, he's walking towards 2. What, where do you think you're going to be? I, that was pretty easy. How'd you get that? Because I can plug it in, can I? Yeah, because, because in this case, there's a key difference here. And this may not seem like much, but this is actually, this is kind of, this is subtle. He actually does end up standing on the point x equals, or y equals 7, doesn't he? That's not what the limit is asking about. It just asks where he thinks he's going to be. But the fact that where he thinks he's going to be happens to coincide with where he actually is going to be just makes it easy, right? In the case we dealt with first, unfortunately, where he was going to be wasn't real. They did the, he wasn't going to be anywhere. And so we had to find out where he thought he was going to be using some other tricks. If the function is defined at x equals 2, and it's not a weird function with all kinds of gaps in it and stuff like that. Say it's just a nice, smooth function. Smooth is actually a calculus word we'll talk about next time. Uh, then where he's going to be is easy to find. And we'll just say, hey, where do you think you're going to be? Well, he's going to be there, so he must think he's going to be there as he walks along the function. Make sense? OK, I, oh, we're out of here like in a minute, aren't we? OK, I, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put up a, we're going to do the first assignment, really, really small. I'm going to, I'll put it on, everyone knows how to get to Moodle. Yeah. Okay, I will just put it on Moodle. It'll be just a very short book assignment on the, on 1.2. We still have a couple things to cover in 1.2, but just to kind of get going on math a little bit, you might want to delve into that a little bit. All right.